already get lit up? I have a microphone. <laughs> well, thank you all for attending. We're really, really psyched about this. Uh, this is um, this is just really cool. And uh, I want to introduce you all, starting here at the left, Chris Carota. Yeah. And Senior Jefferson Waffle. <laughs> Both these guys uh, probably uh, you and you they. They lit you up in so many ways throughout these years, I'm sure. They've got some stories to share and uh, and some techniques to show you. I know a lot of you all see the lights, but probably wonder what really takes place and how it works. And let me tell you something, folks. These little machines that you see that look like aliens that kind of have their own life and they look pretty smart, they do nothing without this machine. And this machine does nothing without these machines. So. Uh, let's start off, um, Chris, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your story, who you are, what you do, and why you do it, and how you do it. Okay, hi, everybody. I mean, wow. This is a total honor. I'm just I'm thrilled to be here in front of you guys. Um, I'm usually up there, not down here, so being on stage, a little bizarre for me, but I'll do the best I can for you. Um, my background, it's kind of funny. Um, all right, well, I, back in the late 80s, I was living in Burlington, Vermont, and I was going to see fish in bar. Woo! I was a fan, and, uh, you know, there would be like 12 people in the audience. And um, we would, uh, they would always they would play a bar called Nectar's. I mean, yeah. the kind of famous place, and we would, it would always be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Me and all my friends would go Sunday night, we'd have class on Monday at UVM, and we'd all kind of say to each other, no, I'm not coming on Monday or Tuesday, I have school. And then Monday night, we're all always there again. Tuesday night, we're all always there again, blowing off classes and doing basically anything to see the dance. So um, I started taking guitar lessons from Trey simply because he was the best guitar player in town. And I was a big fan and just, you know, he's the guy I wanted to learn from. And one day at a guitar lesson, he asked me if I knew anybody who wanted to help carry some gear, some like amps and stuff, to the van after the gig. And I said, I know, so I'll do it. I'll be happy to do it. Me. <laughs> so I did that for about a week. And um, they had just bought uh, these four little lights, like a red one, a blue one, a green one, a yellow one. And they had a guy who was doing the light board was the size of like a paperback book. And um, I'm sure some of you guys have heard this story before, but yep. we were doing a show and the guy who they had doing the little light board came up to me in the middle of the set and said, hey man, I really need to go to the bathroom. Can you cover for me? Well, I was like, yeah, sure, go ahead. So I covered for him. The song was called uh, Fly Famous Mockingbird. Yeah! And um, after the show, Trey walked up to him and said, hey man, I really felt like you were finally starting to get it during the Fly Famous Mockingbird. <laughs> So I overheard this conversation, and I, uh, you know, I just felt like I should say something. So I, I walked up to Trey after that, and I said, hey, man, I just want you to know that he was in the bathroom, and that was me. I just, I know the song, so I just kind of pushed the button at the right time. The next week, Trey called me up on a Thursday, and we had a show on Friday. He goes, hey, you're uh, going to be doing the lights, and I went, I don't know anything about doing the lights. I don't even know how to set them up. And he said, don't worry, we'll figure it out together. That was March 30th, 1989. That's why I don't start drinking until separate. I've always remembered that story. I never want to have to pee during the show. I will not have anything to say. Uh, my first word was actually light. I know it sounds like a made up story, but I've always just sort of been fascinated with bright things. And uh, never had any aspirations, like, like Chris, never set out to be a lighting designer. Um, I was always a musician from a very young age and fascinated with rhythm and guitar and drum. You played drums, right? Guitar, yeah. drums, clarinet, saxophone, piano. Wow. Yeah. Touche. Which I think is the, the one thing that we have, in, or one of the things we have in common is the, the musical background, because it's 
well, you know, I don't have as much technical prowess as a lot of, you know, electricians and techs. What we have is, the, you know, the rhythm, the way to feel music and interpret music like a musician. Um, so that was my background was, you know, growing up playing guitar with my dad. Then video, so mimicking um, mar the, the marriage of audio and video, especially slow motion, to create really dramatic scenes. I, I noticed from a very young age when I would edit a slow song with, you know, video of somebody hugging or high-fiving or smiling, that everyone would get a little bit misty-eyed. And I realized how easy it was to sort of control people's emotions. <laughs> wow. it, was, it was so easy, I'd make like a graduation video and people hugging in slow motion to a really emotive song. There was never a dry eye in the house. Even when I was in college, I would show it to people who had never met the people in the video. They had no personal connection to them and they were still like sobbing because it was this <laughs> emotional connection. And I, I think that's really where my my style came from. I mean, obviously you're a big influence with the, the slow, graceful movement, but that slow, graceful movement is the same thing, where you hit the button and you have the, the slow, rising white lights, and everyone in the venue always puts their hands in the air. Yeah. It's the same thing as the people hugging in slow motion, for me, in my, in my background. So, the way I got into lighting specifically was uh, similar. I was managing a young band, and they were playing places like, I don't think we actually did Nectars, but Club Toast. Um, Wetlands and you know Harper's Ferry in Boston, little bar gigs, and because I wasn't as good as the musicians in the band, they were all Berkeley school music, you know, phenoms. I was friends with them, and I said, well, you guys should stick to the music, and I'll do the, you know, everything else. And so we didn't have an LD, and I would just hit red and blue and red and blue, very similar to your famous Mockingbird, just because I knew the changes, lived with the band in the house, and heard all the rehearsals, and literally had experienced all these songs just as many times as they did, and. As the band got bigger, I just sort of learned on the fly, and I'm, I'm still learning, but never had any formal training, and one thing led to another, and Mo needed a guy, and I did that, and then I'm freezing a guy, and here we are. Well, before we get into any of the techie stuff, tell, uh, tell everyone a little bit about, and you know, take this out, anyone you can field it and whatnot, but um, tell everyone a little bit about uh, just, you know, what the different styles and techniques and everything's so different, but what um, what are you going for the, when, you, when you're doing this? Is it the song that's inspiring you to do it? Is it, is it the reaction of the audience? Talk a little bit about that. Well, for me, uh, what, what I'm always trying to aspire for in lighting is elegance. I think it's really easy to just take lights and blast them at everybody and just kind of pop them. I always kind of try to make things as elegant as possible, which is kind of where the slow movement things started happening for me. I didn't want lights to just jump from here to there and jump from here to there. I wanted them to get there very gracefully in a very pretty way. Um, I just always wanted things to stay as pretty as possible. I figured, uh, you know, that's kind of what I like to see. I felt that mood and color were very important to certain songs. If there's like a nice slow ballad, I felt that the right colors really would enhance that as opposed to using every color in every song, that kind of thing. So I was talking like your blues and your greens and your dark purple always have like a nice soft sort of vibe to it. And then your reds and your oranges and your whites were when your, your big power rock would kind of start happening. So um, that's kind of how I approached it. It was really just more about being elegant. Um, and that's kind of, even from day one up until today, that's always my number one goal. Is Try to keep everything pretty and elegant. I mean, I know everyone knows who's seen Fish that there's plenty of pop in your face stuff going on, but it's, there's also plenty of elegance as well, at least that, that's what I'm trying to accomplish. So. I believe part of your question was about the audience, right? Um, that, that can totally, the same way it influences the bands playing sometimes. I mean, if, if it's a really energetic audience and people are freaking out, that might sort of egg me on to do more flashy, you know, strobing or whatever, versus, and then the band as well, you know, the band, I'm really at the end of the day following the band, so if the band is, you know, sort of raging and doing more uh, of the, you know, feeding off the energy from the crowd, I'm gonna be feeding off of them, and it's like this whole vortex thing. Um, so that influences a lot, and, and really, I mean, a lot of what I do is, same with you, is total improv. I mean, even, I know you've, in, 
since the coming back from the hiatus or the third hiatus or whatever it was, you, you started doing more song cues. But prior to that, you, you never had that, right? You always do. It's it's kind of improv uh, within structure. Right. I mean, um, there are song there are plenty of songs in the fish where if you just improv all the time and try to stay with the song, you can you can make the changes on the downbeat and you can make things happen, but oftentimes, uh, you know, there's a vision that screams for more than that, you know what I mean? So uh, we started going deeper into programming so that on very complicated songs, it's not just color changes or not just quick things happening, but more little teeny little twinkles and elegant things happening right in the right place. You know, little like rolls of light. You see, when I, I have this thing I do, I call the one shot, where a roll of white light just kind of goes across the lighting rig. Things like that, where instead of just blue, red, that kind of thing, now we have just little things to kind of enhance those same moments in music, but they're just, they're, they're more interesting to look at, and they're a little more vibey, and, uh, that's really uh, the kind of programming we do lately, is just try to try to make uh, simple things look, you know, pretty, I guess. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I, you know, I have a few songs. Uh, Mantis, when the, when the band released that album, I, that was the first song I ever written specifically for a song with what we call a cue stack, where there's the same cues during the same sections of the song all the time. Um, but a lot of the songs, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, I'm just hitting, you know, some variable of white and yellow, you know, make this part look bright, make this part look cool, you know, blues and purples, make this part hot, reds and yellows, but it's it's not always the same unless, like you said, it's a more complicated song you want the nuances. But as far as improv, the, the audience sort of always dictates how the band is going to play, I, I think, and then therefore what I'm going to do following the band. And so let's uh, let's break it into a little bit about the uh, gear you're using and, and about not just the gear you're using now, but, uh, but about uh, Chris, you could probably touch a lot about the gear you first started using when you're working with fish, and the difference of using the gear now versus uh, the work, the load that you have to put into the gear in the beginning. Because it's a lot different now the, what this gear is able to do. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the gear that you guys are using. Well, I'm a lot more old school than Jeff. I started doing this in the late '80s. And literally, like I said before, the first light board in these little bars was about this big. I had like six little faders. And it was just, I don't know if anybody's familiar with what par cans are. They're just, uh, most of the lights you see in a club, it's just like a can with a gel on it, and it just turns on and off. You know what I mean? That's about it. And uh, when Fish was up and coming and getting more popular and more popular, uh, you know, we started to need, you know, technology upgrades and that kind of thing. And when we first started, there were only uh, four of us on the crew. There was a monitor guy, a sound guy, myself, and kind of a manager. And um, as we started getting bigger, uh, I started noting that these guys weren't around anymore. Because when the technology came, they couldn't handle the new technology. You needed it to grow, that kind of thing. So um, as I noticed my friends, one by one, start to disappear, I took it upon myself to uh, attend some uh, moving like programming courses and things like that because I wanted to keep up with the technology so I wouldn't wind up having it outgrow me and not be capable, be capable to do the things that I needed to do. So I started going to Dallas, Texas and taking Verilite classes. I learned how to fix lights, I learned how to program lights, I learned the gambit just because I thought it was good knowledge to have and I really wanted to keep up on what was going on because I liked what I did and I wanted to keep doing it. And you know, the lights that we use, lights that we see behind us, and you know, these things are really cool. These things like flying the Enterprise when you stand in front of them, you know what I mean? Like, and I really, it, I really wanted to know how to do that. I didn't want it to surpass me, so I made a personal effort on my own dime and on my own time to go and learn this stuff so that I could keep up with fish and be able to provide what I knew we were gonna need in the future. So, um, that's what I did. And uh, you know these these lighting consoles compared to what I started out with are, are they're just amazing. You they can literally do anything. Uh, this one in front of you this is called a Grand MA. It's a German light board. It's pretty much become an industry standard. And um, the nice thing about it is just in the most simple way you can 
take anything that you program or create or write and put it anywhere on the light board. So, can I, can I move this? Yeah. How do you spell fish in the lights and fish in the I love that. I'll tell you about it. It's awesome. Anyway, so, um, let's see what we've got here. This, this is Jeff showing here. So, if I hold down this button, I'm strobing the lights, right? And it's a button over here. I don't know if you guys can see it. But I can. There we go. I can say, copy this button to here, and now it's over here on this fader. Or is it? There it is. Right? So I can put a strobe or any cue I write, this example being a strobe, I could put it on a fader, I could put it on a button, I could put it on one of these little touchscreen tiles, I can put it wherever I want. So as a lighting designer, the great thing about using this desk is that everybody can lay it out however they're most comfortable. So if you're really comfortable pushing the buttons over here, then you'll put your stuff over here. If you're really comfortable putting stuff on faders, you'll put it over here. You may want color changes on faders, but strobe effects on a button over here. So you can literally put anything anywhere, which is the beauty of this light board. So if I sat down with 50 lighting designers, all with Grand M.A.'s, and we looked at all their pages and how they have it laid out, all 50 people would have it laid out completely different than the other guy, because you can literally fine-tune it to your way, the way you're most comfortable. That's one of the really great features about today's technology. You couldn't do that before. Old light boards, the faders did this, the buttons did that, and that's it, get used to it. So, um, you know, just the versatility of this makes an incredibly powerful tool. And the, the downside to that is for someone like me, I've, I've become so accustomed to this board and I've been really spoiled that I've pretty much only used this board since day one, um, eight or nine years ago when I started with Mo, that when I go into a rare situation, which probably happens you know, two or three times a year, but it happened in Fort Lauderdale just a couple days ago, and I'm, you know, we're not traveling with our truck because we're getting on a boat, forced to use a, a venue, uh, much lower end <laughs> technology, to say the yeah. least. And uh, I, I'm really, you know, useless in that. I mean, I feel, I feel really out of place. I can still sort of, I know the music, that's the one thing I have going for me, but it's it's hard to adapt, because this is really the the top of the, you know, the food chain, but, except for the, the Grand M.A. 2, which Chris uses now. Um, but anyway, to go back to what he was talking about, I, I started on park hands as well, in bars, and then Wetlands Preserve is where I, I learned to run moving lights. And I'm such a man of, Chris, I'm, I'm such a fan of, uh, I'm a man of habit. So literally the, the first most primitive moving light console I ever used was the LCD controller. Is that, do you know that one with, with the with joystick? I don't know if that's the brand name, L, just LCD. Is that like, like, like Atari? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> it, it sort of looks like, yeah. Okay. But literally the, the, the way I had the buttons laid out, was white, yellow, pink, blue, red. And you'd hit the button and it would go to that color. And I got so used to that that my board is still laid out that way. If you were to see it now, it's those same five buttons and that's just because I feel more comfortable having everything be the way it's always been. It's just muscle memory. And a lot of the way I run my show is I don't wanna have to be thinking in the moment. I know it's something you hear musicians talk about a lot is, you know, and you said that the tray called it no mind, right? Yeah. Uh, not thinking, trying to block your ego out of the equation. When when Trey and I don't hook up, we have to, we kind of have this mental link. I know that makes no sense, but it's true. It's like unspoken. I know where he's going, he knows where I'm going, we follow each other. <laughs> when we don't hook up, uh, I don't know if you guys ever saw that movie, The Last Samurai. It's a cheesy Tom Cruise movie. But there's a line in it when he's doing the sword fight and he can't get it right. And the guy walks up to him and goes, too many minds. Too many mind, no mind. And that's our philosophy, Trey and I have that philosophy. When we don't hook up, we meet up backstage and separate and go, too many minds, no mind, no mind. That's kind of right. how we think it. You don't, there is no, when you're doing it, when I'm doing it, there's no thinking, you're just going. Like, there's, it, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the music and the moment and the lights and everything. 
kind of take control of me and them and everything, and it's all this one giant rolling ball, you know? It's not, I don't think to myself, I'm gonna do this next, and I'm gonna do this after that. I just do what feels right at that second, and that's really it with this, so. <laughs> So in an effort to not think, I, I keep everything laid out as simple as possible, and I talk to a lot of more technical people, and they say, oh, why don't you, you know, you can go to another page and put these buttons here, and I always just get a little bit intimidated. I say, you know what, that's all well and good, and that may be technically correct, and it might be more, you know, more efficient, thank you, to, uh, to move around or whatever, but for me, it's, it's too much to think about. Oh, what page am I going to? Where's my home page? And, you know, a band like Humphreys or Fish, they're, the changes are just coming so quickly that if you even take half a second to think, am I going to page six or page five? Like the moment's already gone. So for me, it's just laying every, and this is just how I am. Again, everyone runs the board differently, but I like to keep it as simple as possible and, and literally run it the same way I ran it day one when I was taught how to use uh, a moving lights console, so. So you'd say a lot that it's, uh, this is your instrument. I mean, this is like, you know, you're able to, just like uh, someone shredding a guitar, you're shredding the lights in a lot of ways. The cool thing is, I'm sorry to interrupt. The cool thing is what we were saying before about this particular kind of technology and this light board. What Jeff said is exactly what this is all about. He grew up on a certain board a certain way and had this muscle memory on this certain other LCD console that he's talking about. So when he went to this, this is flexible enough that he could set this up the way his brain works, which is based off of that. Excuse me. And it works for him. It's laid out his way, the way his mind likes it, based on how he grew up. And for me, it's different based on how I grew up. And that's what's great about today's lighting consoles is that you can set them up whatever way makes you the most comfortable. He does it his way, I do it my way, completely separate backgrounds. And that's one of the things that makes it so great. So. And when you uh, when talking about linking in with the musicians, I mean, you've got these, these musicians that are completely just, you know, a lot of times you have a structured song, but they're improving it all along at the same time. Uh, in this style of music that we're on jam cruise with. <laughs> uh, can you, Chris, talk a little bit about Create Your Own Hey? And, um, and because a lot of, if those of you who are familiar with Fish may have heard this story uh, from the musician's perspective, but what's really neat about the lighting designers is that they are a member of the band. I mean, just as much as, as a guitar player, a keyboard player, a drummer is a member of the band, so is a lighting designer. And this is a great example of how that comes to play. Create Your Own Hay is a listening and communicating exercise that Trey Anastasio came up with. And we would sit in a band that used to all live in the same house in Winooski, Vermont. This is like 1989. And we would all sit in the living room and all the instruments would be set up and I'd set up some lights and I've got an old light board that I was telling you guys about. And the exercise was, and we did this for years, every day, hours and hours. The exercise was everybody would play one thing repetitively. So Trey would play one riff repetitively. John Fishman would play one drum thing repetitively. Paige, Mike, and I'd be doing something on the lights. And the, what, what you would do is, you would focus in on what each individual was doing, not listening to it as a whole. Like, I hear exactly what Trey is doing. I hear exactly what Fish is doing. I hear exactly what Mike's doing. They would see exactly what I was doing. Once everybody was able to tune in individually to each person, you'd say, hey, out loud. Once everybody said the word hey, everybody then altered what they were doing slightly, just a little change. And then you re-listen to everybody, and when you've tuned in, I changed something on the lights, you'd say hey. And you go around for hours and hours, slight change, slight change, listen, 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 listen. Communicate by saying hey, I hear you, I hear you and you and you and you, you see me, hey altar for hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks and years and years. And that exercise, I believe in my heart, has a lot to do with how fish works. Because on stage when fish is being fish and they're doing their thing and jamming, 
they're listening to each other, they're communicating with each other, they're still doing that now, 20 whatever years later, individualizing each person and either following them or finding a new direction to go. There is no real leader that takes the jam somewhere else. They kind of lead each other by listening to each other. Fish has always been all about listening and communicating. So that exercise we did for years and years. And, you know, I mean, I, I can't say for sure because, you know, fish is who fish is, but I believe that the growth of fish and the way fish works has a lot to do with that exercise that we would do religiously in practice every single day. Let's create your own egg. And Jeff, uh, what about you? Uh, when, do you? Talk a little bit about rehearsal. I mean, how much uh, does a lighting designer uh, participate in the rehearsal of the band? Well, my situation with Umphreys is a lot different because I came in sort of, well, we don't know how long their total career is going to be, but at least, you know, halfway through. I wasn't there in the, uh, in the early days like Chris was uh, with Fish. But, so I don't know specifically, I know they, their, their story with the, the Jimmy Stewart jam, uh, they, I'm sure most of you know this story, but it, it was an improvisational exercise that happened early on in their career, and now they still work it into the set list. Um, so I wasn't around when they were actually you know, forming the building blocks of their improvisational style, but currently, a lot of the rehearsal goes on either backstage, they have practice here that we tour with, or on stage during sound check. And I'll generally, if it's a new song, I'll generally just sort of be back there doing what I'm doing, assuming the day is gone well enough where I have the luxury, you know, because I have to get everything programmed for the show. So, but assuming we're at a good point, or if it's a, if it's a multiple night run, um, New Year's Eve, for example, we had a three night run pageant, and you know, the second and third nights, they were practicing a lot of covers, because we had a horn section sitting in. So I had the luxury of running the songs as they were learning them with the horn section. And I approach what I do very similar to a musician, so I, I had the benefit of hearing them, you know, assigned parts and going over it, and I was sort of learning it as they were learning it, and that's really a, a and nice tell, advantage. Tell everyone also a little bit about, now Jeff mentioned that he um, he's, he came into the, working with Humphreys McGee, as they've already had a lighting designer for several years. Now when you come into that situation, um, are you learning that old, not the programming, but are you picking up the design that the other uh, lighting designer is doing, is the band's familiar as part of the show, or are you coming up with all new, the whole new clean slate? Oh, it's definitely a clean slate. I actually had not seen that many Humphrey shows. I mean, I would see them once or twice a year when it was, sorry, when it was convenient. But you know, like they would come to my town or I'd be at a festival and I always enjoyed them, but I was not intimately familiar with their song catalog or their lighting design. Uh, so when I started, my biggest challenge was trying to make it look different than Mo because I you know, established my style with Mo and the first couple shows I did with Humphreys, I, I got some feedback from people saying, oh, it just looks like a Mo show. And I really. I had to sort of come up with a new way to to light, basically, and, and I got lucky because uh, Martin came out with a brand new fixture almost within the same month that I got hired with Humphreys, and that's the Mac 3, which Fish also uses, and that made it really easy to have it look different because it was such a new fixture. It's, you know, top of the line, so it's easy to come up with, with new ways of it was a clean slate, and also they released the new album, Mantis, so it was a lot of new material. So you're sitting there listening to the new material, brainstorming, so that must have been a pretty creative, interesting time, just to be sitting in the house, listening to new music, and just being creative, and having to create a whole new show, and a whole new experience. Um, speaking of styles, what, just to let you guys know where we're gonna go with this, we're gonna open up some questions in a little bit. Um, but I'd like for you both to talk a little bit about your styles, maybe even share some examples, and then uh, uh, Chris, would you mind even uh, doing a, sample with some music and explain that style. Sure, my style is purple speakers. Yeah. <laughs> I know this sounds nuts, but I can't light fish without my purple sneakers. <laughs> I kid you not. It's just a thing, I'm like like that, so. Anyway, um. That sounds like some uh, cash elevator uh, yeah. question that. Uh, <laughs> um, that's, that's good trivia. The, the main thing about my style, the, the, the signature thing that I do, um, and you know, it just kind of, just, I didn't like strive to do this, it just kind of developed with me as a person is, oftentimes when I hit, when I push the button, I'm sure you guys all know music, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, I don't push the button on one, I push the button five seconds before one and have the lights programmed with five seconds of time 
so that they do their thing and land on one. I don't know how I learned how to do this. I don't know. It's just how I do it. So when you see a fish show and you see the lights move and they just stop right on the downbeat, it's because I pushed the button five seconds ago and watched it play. And over the years, I've gotten pretty good at it. <laughs> Thanks, I'm glad you all like that. I mean, I, I've never met another lighting designer, operator, whatever, who even remotely does it like that. It's just kind of my own thing. And like Jeff was saying before, the whole self-taught thing, being self-taught and just kind of approaching it my own way, that's just kind of how it happened for me. So uh, when next time you guys see a fish show, you'll see that happen and you'll go, that's what he was talking about. Two, uh, two, little, two little tidbits of uh, fact for you all. Uh, Chris, uh, if you ever go to breakfast with him, he knows what you're going to order five seconds before you order. <laughs> and he's also not allowed to play the lottery in the city of New York, or sorry, the state of New York, uh, excuse me, because, um, again, he knows the numbers five seconds before. 13, 23, 30. I, uh, I have an interesting story that I, that I actually told. Sorry, Scotty B. I told the story last night, so I don't want to repeat myself, but for the rest of you. I went and saw the Australian Pink Floyd, and they're, they're pretty big. They like sold out an arena in Boston, and they had this huge light rig, and I was really fascinated to, to see a really cool light show and have a big budget. And they played Shine On You Crazy Diamond. And the lighting designer, no offense to me, he did an amazing job, but just that one line where they say, Shine On, at the chorus, he was clearly hitting the button on the downbeat, and it was a two or three second fade, and it's a really dramatic moment. For, I don't know if most of you were probably there last night when Humphreys yeah. did. But yeah. he, was, he was hitting the button on the downbeat, which is innate in us. You know, we're all used to growing up dancing, and everything's on the one. You clap your hands on the one, you pump your fist. So it's, it's really hard to do what Chris does and hit it early. But I noticed it because I was, I had just been watching the, the DVD, the Pink Floyd Pulse, with that ridiculous light rig, and Mark Rickman, their LED, uh, you know, it's just such a master and it's such an iconic song and, and the visual aspect to me is, is part of the um, part of the whole thing and it goes from purple and it slowly goes up to white and it hits you in the eyes just as they're saying shine on and it's so vital to the song and it was happening two or three seconds late every time in the chorus and it's driving me nuts I mean I'm in a venue with 10,000 people and everyone's freaking out I'm like no no it's wrong like, <laughs> I mean I didn't tell anyone this but this is what goes on in my head and I literally, I came home that night and I opened up an email. This is when I worked for Mo, and there was an email saying, oh, by the way, we're gonna cover uh, Wish You Were Here on New Year's Eve at Radio City. It was the first time we did Radio City, which also has the same shape as the Pink Floyd uh, light rig with the, the dome. And that just blew my mind, the serendipity of that. So I went and I, I learned the whole album and I was so excited that I had this opportunity to light shine on the way I thought it, it should be lit. And then Mo didn't wind up learning the album in time, so we scrapped it. And then I got the job with Humphreys years later, and I was very excited that I could finally light it. And uh, But yeah, hitting it early, is it's counterintuitive. Yeah. Here, see, feel, production.